Okay, in this lecture, we're going to cover peer to peer networks, which are a little bit different from your commercial websites, and another nice example of our internet scale application. So, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction and then talk about, give a couple of concrete examples of, you know, free net, of um, peer to peer networks. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about Freenet, a little bit about BitTorrent, and some of the issues. So, if you want to know the nuts and bolts of these things, you really need to look at the papers, and I've given you some papers on the course website. You know, this is just going to be a fairly loose overview of how these things work, which will give you some ideas, and then we'll do a little bit of an emulation exercise in one of the seminars if we have time. Okay, so a lot of internet scale applications have a central server, right? They, um, the central server or servers holds all, the, all, the, all of the relevant information. Um, it might use lots of different machines, like Cassandra database has lots of different machines working together. Uh, there might be distributed data processing and so on, but it's still essentially all of the information is managed and held in a single place. And if you blow that place up and, and all of its copies, um, then that'd be that, you'd lose all the information. <coughs> so these are all centralized architectures. And the centralized architectures have many advantages. Um, it's easy to monitor easy to update and maintain. You've got full control over the data. All the data is in these servers. You know where it is, and you've got full control over it. And you can make some money from it as well, right? I mean, all of the big scale internet applications, um, you know, all the big commercial websites, you know, they're making money and that's what's paying for all the servers. But it can be expensive, right? Uh, if you wanna distribute content on a large scale, it can be very expensive to maintain a large centralized system with a large user base. And this can lead to the problem that you have to make money from the user base. I mean, you probably have seen the appeals for help from Wikipedia. Well, Wikipedia is a pretty large scale internet application, um, but it doesn't make any money from its user base. So you have to have the, you know, the big banner ad at the top asking for donations from time to time to keep the whole thing running. So this necessity to make money um, can be a bit of a constraint on your internet scale applications, particularly if you're trying to run them on a nonprofit basis. They're also easy to shut down by governments. So you've got a single central system. The government doesn't like it. They can close it down. It's also a single point of failure. If a virus runs rampant in your centralized, in your, date, you know, your server farm where everything's stored, um, you could be stuffed. You can steal all the customer's data in a single, in a single, you know, single hit, single swoop. And you've got a single choke point for internet traffic. Everything's trying to get through to that single centralized server, so you have to do all these complex caching strategies with Akami and so on and so forth. And this, some of these motivations has led to the appearance of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And it's, and it's a neat idea. So here's the sort of centralized architecture, all the clients trying to contact the single central server or servers. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you've, you're distributing the same software across the different nodes. All the nodes are working in the same way and they're passing the data between themselves and storing the data in a distributed way across the whole system. So instead of a single company or user paying for the big iron server or servers which provide all the content, you know, each user is contributing to the system as well as using resources of the system. And the idea is that if you get the algorithms right, if you get the software right, it can all work smoothly without any central administration. No one's making this, what's making the system run and function is the algorithms on the, on, that's running across, on it, the same algorithms running on each of the different nodes. And if they're written well, then the system can distribute data and store data across itself and retrieve data from itself. So as I said, these peer-to-peer -peer networks typically have some kind of clever self-organizing algorithms that, that dynamically balance the storage, the processing of loads, they prioritize what's stored, what's retrieved, and so on. They're fault tolerant because of the peer-to-peer -peer network you know, you're dealing with users' computers here, typically, and users switch their computers on and off. They have different, um, different computers have different amounts of power, different amounts of memory, different amounts of storage, and so on. So they have to be very fault tolerant. And I said, peers join and leave all the time, so you have to be able to take, you have to take that into account in the way you design this, these things. But if you get them right, you can share data and resources on a large scale. So, you know, some of these uh, file sharing networks, you know, this sharing massive, huge amounts of data every day, and they work pretty well. And there is some potential for anonymity. So Tor, I gave an example, is a peer-to-peer -peer network. So there's Bitcoin, which I'm going to cover later. And Freenet is very much um, 
designed to be a network that enables sh anonymous sharing online. So the peer-to-peer -peer network is all about the algorithm, really, that places the data across multiple hosts and controls data access to it in a way that balances the workload and, ensure, and, in, and maximizes availability while minimizing the impact on the individual person's computer. As I said, nodes are switched on and off, they have different performance, they can be unreliable, so you can't guarantee access to a given resource. If a file is stored on one particular user's computer and they decide to take a week's holiday, then no one's going to be able to access it. But what you can do is you can make multiple copies of that file across lots of different computers, and that can increase the probability that any individual user can actually download it. So it's a trade-off between uh, access to the data and the amount of storage that's allocated to that particular piece of data, and you can make the probability of failure to access the resource um, arbitrarily small. So if you make loads and loads of copies of that data across the entire network, then pretty much there's a very high probability um, that at least one of those machines is going to be switched on at a given point in time. There's different ways in which people have written or created the peer-to-peer -peer networks. So the sort of one way in which you can do this, the sort of lightest way, is to have a single centralized index server um, that holds the information about where each of the files is. Because the problem is, the problem these networks have got to solve is how can you, it's all very well storing the data, but how can I actually find that data? How can I retrieve that data? How can I know which computers have which, which piece of information? That's the, that's the key problem they've got to solve with their algorithms. So one way of solving that is to have a central resource that holds the location of all the files on the network. So the peers go to that central resource and, find, and say, well, where can I find you know, the latest Beyonce video, let's say, and then the, ind the index server, whatever it's called, will tell them which computer to contact for that piece of data. And why is this not working? So this is the idea. So it's still appears to be in the network to some extent, even though it's got this index server, because all this index server is, is holding is a relationship between uh, the piece of data or the file name, whatever it is, and the machine on which it's stored. So this, this, say this computer, Say this, say this computer here wants to obtain you know, a particular piece of particular file or document, goes to the index server, finds, finds out that this one has the, this, this IP address, the IP address of this machine is the right place to go for that data, and then this machine goes off and downloads it in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So it's a bit like um, yeah, Napster, for example, worked on this model, and early versions of uh, BitTorrent as well. And then you've got the opposite extreme, um, where the peers are indexing the files that they're sharing. So this, this is much more uh, along the lines of a distributed hash table, as I'll come to later. And then you've, so you can, uh, so, <coughs> so there's no central server, and there's some clever way in which you can do search across multiple nodes in order to find the file that you're looking for. And the early version of GNU Teller did this in a non-clever way. They just had a flooding search. So one peer asked another peer, who asked another peer, all it's, all it's so I, one peer, asked all of its friends, and all of its friends asked all, its fr all of its friends until one of them actually found the appropriate file. So this was hugely inefficient. But uh, Freenet has this heuristic key-based search that's a bit more clever and allows the search to be much more efficient, and therefore it reduces the network traffic and makes the whole network much more efficient. But this is fully distributed, and later generations such as Cord and Tapestry you know, turn this into a sort of distributed hash tail type architecture. So in this case, um, that's a pure peer-to-peer -peer model. Well, that's not a good example because it doesn't really have a search, but um, it, it, there's no centralized index server. You're just sort of searching amongst the other computers and download. When you found the computer that has the data, you can then download it directly. And there's a sort of intermediate sort of hybrid model where you have a number of powerful peers who are maybe less likely to be switched off. And these are the super nodes, and they're the ones that store the file information and they update it between them, and this increases scalability, because then you, so you have some, some super peers, these sort of bigger computers, they have the, the information about where files are stored, and then it's much more efficient, because then you can just contact your local super peer, find out where the data is, and then go off and get it from the, from the other one. So there's less potential for shutdown, because the government would have to shut down all the super peers, but then who's, who runs these super peer machines, you know, how do you choose them, and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of issues raised by that. A little bit of history. So we started off with uh, Napster, sort of classic file sharing network, got shut down a link, um, and probably based around the central index server, which made it easy to shut down. Then we got the second generation, which are more scalable, more anonymous, more fault tolerant. So we've got Freenet, Nutella, Kazaa. And then these have kind of evolved into third generation middleware platforms, 
So we've got pastry, tapestry, and cord. So these are sort of distributed hash tables. So the nodes are ways in which you can store a sort of key, a value, sort of key value pair across large numbers of machines potentially. And they're sort of, they're sort of blends because sort of BitTorrent, which we can talk about later, started off being a bit more, a bit like Napster, where you got index servers, and then has moved towards a distributed hash table model for storing the location of the, the, the chunks of the file that the users download. We'll come to that later. Okay, so this is a little bit of statistics about internet traffic. So, you know, this here, this green is the file sharing. I hope you can see it. And so here we have, it's about a quarter roughly of the upstream, file, upstream data in 2015. And maybe, uh, you know, 7%, 7.5% of the downstream. And, you know, large chunk taken up by real-time entertainment. You know, so Netflix and all that kind of stuff. So it still constitutes a significant portion of, net, of internet traffic, particularly, you know, and it's probably remained, you know, maybe quite constant over the years because what's massively increased in recent years is this real-time entertainment, you know, streaming's sort of taken off hugely in the last 10 years. Whereas it appeared to be, far, you know, the bandwidth's increased and so probably the absolute amount of file sharing is probably roughly the same, but the amount, the proportion has gone down because the bandwidth's gone up and the amount of real-time entertainment's gone up. Another way of thinking about peer-to-peer -peer networks is as an overlay network or a, or a network that sort of sits on top of the existing networks, such as the World Wide Web or sits on top of the internet. In which the, and in the overlay network, you, you sort of um, give the nodes names, you define routes between nodes, and you can find files on the node. So all these mechanisms exist in the internet and the World Wide Web, and they also exist in a peer-to-peer -peer network, which sort of sits on top of these other networks. Um, so here you have the sort of the real world, and you have like the IP network, which has its own sets of connections between computers. And then on top of that, you have a naming system like IP addresses. And then on top of that, you have yet another uh, what's called an overlay network, where you have your own unique names, your own unique routes between information, and you can store data on an overlay network, which is a sort of abstract, more abstract layer sitting on top of the internet, which has certain advantages. So you can um, address more objects, like, uh, you know, two to the 128 objects instead of the however many objects you can address with IP addresses. And then you can sort of locate, if you want to, an object doesn't have to exist in a particular physical space, so the actual way in which the network's physically organized doesn't have to correspond to the way in which the network's conceptually organized, if you like. So the patterns within the network can be optimized to, you know, work, can be separated from the network topology anyway. Um, you can have replicas of target objects. You don't necessarily have to access, you know, the object itself to, can exist in many copies and so on. And you can have the limited degree of anonymity. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an introduction to peer-to-peer -peer networks, a little bit of history, different architectures and so on. Now I'm going to talk about one specific peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, which is pretty successful version of, pretty successful, still around today, and gives you a nice example of some of the ways in which you can store and retrieve data um, across it. So the free net, as you might guess from the, from the name, is aimed at uh, freedom of speech, anonymity online, those kinds of users. So it enables you to share uh, files anonymously. You can publish free sites across it, and you can have anonymous chat on forums. Some countries don't like it, um, but it's used, um, it's one of these tools, as I'll talk about later, that you, know, you can say, well, you know, it's used by terrorists or whatever, but it's also used by non-governmental non organizations and journalists and so on to communicate from places like China, which have more strict uh, censorship laws across its uh, border. So it's a good or a bad thing, depending on who you are. Now, different, different uh, modes. So low security means you, you're sort of a bit more open to the rest of the free net. So you're, you can potentially be snooped on more easily and compromised more easily. Or dark net, where you're only connecting to your friends and your friend connect to your friends and so on. So this, can, this is more secure, but it's also harder to access content because everything has to be routed through your friends. Uh, this is like higher performance because you can directly contact more other nodes. Now I mentioned briefly um, GNU Tello 0.4, which is a classic example of a bad search because to find, to find information, I contact all of my friends and they contact all of their friends and they contact all of their friends and so on. So you massively, rapidly get a huge huge number of requests building up with this flooding search and then eventually you might find the file you want coming back and, and you're taking up an awful lot of the bandwidth of the network. Freenet tries to do things in a much more clever way. 
And the analogy they've got is uh, finding Michael Jordan's phone number. So Michael Jordan's like a famous basketball player. I know absolutely nothing about him. About him. And suppose you wanted to give him a call and you know, congratulate him on, on his latest game, let's suppose. So one way you could do this is this sort of centralized model. Um, we just flick through. We, we know that he lives in California, let's say, or know that he lives in LA. So we get at the LA phone book, look through the phone book, and see, look for the Michael Jordan, and then we give him a call and you know, problem solved. So that's like the central, centralized model. Of course, it won't really work with Michael Jordan because he's almost certainly ex-directory, and there might be like 200 Michael Jordans in LA. And this is what it means by being easily blocked, right? Michael Jordan will sort of hide his phone number from this centralized server because he doesn't want to share it. So that's not going to work. Now, what we could do is we could um, ask absolutely everyone we know, um, you know, do they know Michael Jordan's phone number? We could say, well, you know, I could ask everyone I meet on the street, I could ask everyone at work, I could ask all my friends or my family and all the rest of it. It would take me a lot, lot of time to do all that, right? And it would take them a lot of time. And then they would go off and ask all their friends, and that would take an awful lot of time. And all the messages coming back to me would be enormously complicated. It would be a total mess and take a lot of time. <coughs> it's unscalable and it's wasteful. You know, I don't know how long it would take to reach the entire world, this kind of flooding search. So instead, we've got a, the more smart model operated by this, the works in Freenet, whereby I, instead of asking all my friends, I say, well, I've got some friends who, you know, maybe um, played college. Maybe I've got a friend who played college basketball, right? So I ask him, you know, do you know Michael Jordan's phone number? Now, he probably doesn't know Michael Jordan's phone number, but he maybe knows someone else. Maybe there's a, a former coach of this friend who played college basketball, and, there's some, and this coach will have a, you know, more powerful set of contacts, and these set of contacts might eventually lead me to Michael Jordan. So if I do a heuristic, what this, what's called a heuristic search, I'm, I'm looking... You know, it's a very channeled search focusing on looking, contacting people who are more likely to have the information that I require. That's, that's the idea. So let's, let's go back to Freenet. So how does it actually work? Well, we've got this gl globally unique ID. Um, that's like the name of each, each. It's based on storing files, storing and retrieving files. Each file has this globally unique ID. Each node in the network contributes storage to the network. So the data is stored you know, on the nodes that are participating in the network. And then we've got a routing table that holds the links, the links that my node has to other nodes and um, the sort of um, some idea about which keys the different nodes that I'm connected to uh, store. So which, you know, one node might have, you know, basketball-related information, one node might have, you know, uh, fishing information, whatever. I mean, it's not like that, but it's, it's to pursue the analogy that that's the kind of idea. So these globally unique IDs, we've got different keys, and the key is essentially a hash of the file to be stored. And you can have more complica complicated keys, but roughly speaking, we take the data, do a hash on it, and then that's the key that we use to store it. Uh, so it's going to be unique, um, unless we're storing an identical file, in which case you know, it doesn't really matter that, it, that it's not unique. Uh, and then to find, right, so that's the data that we're storing, this, the, uh, the data plus the hash, which is the going to be unique key with maybe some other bits and bobs on top of it. And then but before we can store any data, we need to join the network. So how do we add the node? So first thing we do is we find another node that we can use to link up with. And so we have to find this through some out-of-band means, okay? We need to, maybe there'll be an IP address of starting nodes on the web. Maybe a friend of mine is already a Freenet member and I can link up with his node. So we find, find another node. We generate a public-private key. And then we send an announcement uh, to the existing node, including public key and where I am. So I say to my friend's Freenet node, uh, you know, here's my public key, here's my physical address, I'd like to join the network. And so it, the first node takes the information, forwards it to another node chosen at random, because the node that I'm connecting to will itself be connected to other nodes. And this continues until what's called the time to live runs out. Now, time to live is used quite a bit in Freenet. And time to live is like a, each message that's sent has a, has a number in it called the time to live. And when one node forwards that message on to another node, it decreases this number by one. That's what the time to live is. So if, if I set it as a time to live of 10, let's say, the next node will receive the message with the time TTL of 10, decrease that to nine and send it on to the next node and so on and so forth. And then that message will only be forwarded to a maximum of 10 nodes. So it's a way of limiting the spread of a message within a network. So I send my message, my please can I join message to the first node. 
that sends it on to another node, sends it on to another node until the time to live runs out. So if my time to live is 10, this message gets sent to 10 nodes in total. So we've got a chain of nodes uh, that receive this message and pass it on. And together, they collectively generate a random uh, globally unique ID that corresponds, that's like my globally unique ID, and that makes me responsible for a region of key space. So key space is, you know, each document has like a key and a data, and this globally unique ID that I'm assigned to is, makes, makes, you know, uh, you know, make, means that the data that I store in some way corresponds um, to this globally unique ID. I think that's how I put it. So that if people were searching for uh, a document that's close to this globally unique ID, then I'm more likely to hold that data than someone else. That's what it means roughly. Okay, so I've joined the network. I've got, got my friends. You know, we're all linked together. Um, now the next thing is I actually want to insert my file into the network. So I've assigned my GID to the file and sent a message um, to this it's node. This is my node. So I, I say to the network, here's this file. Here's the, here's the message with the, the key and this time to live value in the message as well. So the first node checks to see if this key exists already. If there's no conflict, then it sends the message on to someone else, sends it on to someone else, on to someone else. Finally, the time to live is going to expire. I've reached a certain number of nodes, and then we'll get an all clear message saying this file doesn't exist in, a, in our local bit of the network. And then we just send the data down with the key, the key and the data down together, whatever, and with an insert message. And then the nodes along the path will record where the data is stored. So they'll either record that it's stored on me, or they'll maybe cache a copy along the way. And then the final sort of bit of it is how do I actually then ac access a file that has a particular globally unique ID. So this is sort of reverse of the process. Then I send, say, I send a request message to, the to a node, say, do you have this file? And then this node that I send the request to, has a, maybe it's connected to 100 nodes. It has to make a choice about which node it sends that request message to. And so it'll pick one that's closest um, to the key, sp to the key of the file that I'm looking for. And this is the heuristic search bit. It'll then say, well, this node over there, its key is kind of the closest match. Um, the ID of the node is the closest match, or the key, the key space that's managing is the closest match to this, to the ID of this document. So I'm going to send my request in that way, over in that direction. And I'm not going to flood all 100 of my, the nodes I'm connected to. I'm just going to connect, send my request to this particular node that's managing this region of key space. And then that node in turn will do the same thing. And this, in, this can narrow down the search much more rapidly. So once we've, you know, once this uh, request message has reached a particular the node that actually has the data, then we get back the uh, response saying, you know, I'm I'm the node that has the data, and maybe and then the then the data is sent back, you know, possibly via a series of intermediate peers, um, until we actually get it back to the user. Yeah, so the files pass back upstream, and, uh, and then the routing, this is like a routing table, and that's what's used to manage this whole heuristic search, you know, for similar keys. And we might get a bit of caching of the file along the way, so that we don't necessarily, the node doesn't necessarily know exactly where the file is stored, and so it's much harder to delete the file from the network. So, that, so along the way, the nodes might occasionally claim that they have the file, even though they just have a way of reaching the file. As I said, we've got this time to live um, in each message. Um, if it reaches zero, the query fails. Um, and so there can be this whole t time to live will tell you maybe how far away something is, if it's like got a certain default value. So in order to reduce the possibility of people tracking requests through the network, um, you can have a sort of what's called a mixed net route before normal routing. So the, the message is sent on a random route through the network and then the time to live counter is started so that it can prevent people from identifying who's sending and receiving the messages and data within the network. Each message has a transaction ID, which is used both for anonymous routing and for blocking of loops. Um, so if, if a message, if a, if a node, because you're bound to get loops through the search if, if you're not careful, but because each message has a transaction ID, if a loop's already, if a, if a node's already seen a message, it's not going to send it to the same place it sent it before. It'll just drop it or send it to a different node. 
So nodes, don't, there's no global picture of the network and all the nodes that are connected to it and all their IP addresses or anything handy like that in, in Freenet. The whole idea is that it provides anonymity online. So I know about the nodes that I'm connected to and they know about the nodes that they're connected to, but there's no sort of direct connection between nodes or it's very limited in Freenet. And these transaction IDs are used um, to uh, maintain this anonym anonymity within the network and as I said, to prevent blocking uh, loops, to prevent loops. And each node monitors the messages that, it's, that have been sent through it and maintains a, uh, a table that also records the state of those messages. And I'll just say a little bit about that to make it a little bit clearer. So this is how we do anonymous reading. So it's A knows that it's connected to B, but it doesn't know anything about D or, these, this is a typo by the way, so this should be F here, but just sort of imagine there's an F. Um, so A knows about B, but it doesn't know about C, D, or F, and B knows about C and D, but it doesn't know about E or A. So A wants to find uh, a particular file. So it's sending a message, I like this file, it has this ID 67, let's say, and it gives this message a transaction ID 334. So it sends that to B. B has this table that records that it's got a message from A saying get file, and the message has a transaction ID 334. And then B says, well, I don't have that file, so I'm going to have a little look for that file in C or D. So it picks one that's closest, you know, got the closest region of key space. So it sends a message to D saying, I'd like this file. And it could generate a different transaction ID. It doesn't matter functionally, but let's suppose it uses the same one. Um, so it sends the same message there. So D receives a message saying that B is looking for this file, but it has no idea that A is looking for the file because it's just saying it's a local message from B to D. And D stores the fact that it's recorded a message, received a message from B, you know, looking for this file. And it says it's got the state, that's what the state of the message is, get file. And D, you know, knows that, you know, asks E for the file. Same transaction ID, sends it to E. Then E has the file, so it sends it back, keeping the transaction ID the same, but in this case it's file data, is the state of the message. And then D can use this information, it's received this message of transaction ID that's a reply to this message, so then it can send the reply back to B because it knows it received that. Sorry, going the wrong way here. So it uses this information in its table to know that this is a message for B, so a reply to a message from B, so it sends the message back to B, and B uses the information in its table to know that it's a reply for a message from A. So then we get the data back to A without A ever knowing that the message came from E. So as I said, <coughs> Freenet's designed for anonymous storage and retrieving of data. It's like, you know, let, let's be free, let's be private kind of approach. And there's various reasons, and if you want to be free and private, people typically tend to do things that governments don't like or that are illegal in various different ways. And so there's good reasons. I've also explained that in Freenet, every, every node contributes storage to the network. So your computer, as you participate in Freenet, could be used to store is being used to store data from other users on the network. Now what if uh, some other user decided to store illegal content on your machine? This is classic, same problem as with cloud providers, right? Or what if they stored controversial material? What if they stored, you know, some kind of awful stuff like, I don't know, bomb making manuals, child pornography, whatever, right? So for this to work, th then if I've got that on my computer, I suddenly become legally liable, I could be arrested, I could be thrown in prison for years, whatever. So people might be kind of reluctant to participate in Freenet if, if they become legally liable for whatever anybody on the network chooses to store on Freenet. So to prevent this, um, uh, what they do is they encrypt the data that's stored on the network. So the, so the data that's stored on Freenet is typically encrypted and then you'd, um, <coughs> and you distribute the keys. So if I say I've stored you know, this document on Freenet, Here's the GUID, you can retrieve it yourself, and here's the decryption key, here's the private key or public key or whatever to decrypt the, to decrypt the network. So in this way, I can participate in Freenet, I can contribute to the storage of Freenet without being liable for whatever happens to be stored on my machine that's done by the algorithm or whatever. So because of this, uh, you know, this key space stuff, which is a little bit too complicated to explain in detail, I strongly recommend you look at the paper for all of that. Um, and this heuristic search, there's a sort of training mechanism that enables the network to become more efficient at looking up data. So the nodes sort of specialize in handling clusters of similar keys, and it becomes much easier to find those keys 
um, by contacting those nodes. And you can, and so they've done various simulations, and it turns out Freenet can locate files, uh, I think eight hops in a 10,000 node network, uh, medium path lengths. That's pretty good, right? It's very fast, very efficient compared to the flooding search um, I described with GNU Tiller uh, 0.4. So even if 30% nodes fail, the median path length still remains below 20. So it's not, it's a much more, uses much less of resources in the network to find data in it. So if you want to find data on Freenet, it's a little bit tricky because there's no way, there's no sort of global index of the files. All you know, all you have to access the files are the global GUID key. So you have to distribute, so the sort of search on Freenet or the maintenance of the meaning of the files has to be done in some outer bandwidth or, or non-Freenet kind of way. There's no closeness between keys. It's designed for storing and retrieving files, just like a hash table or a hash map in, in programming. It is a, effectively a distributed hash table. So if you want to have search, you're going to have to have a separate way in which you can search the files and a separate way of linking the contents of the file to the GUID key, which isn't implemented by, by Freenet. If you, want to find, if you want to extract a file from Freenet, you have to have the GUID key. You can't search the contents of the files because they're all encrypted as well. Now, each computer is contributing storage to the network, and there's a finite amount of storage available on those computers. So what they have is an algorithm that prioritizes space by popularity. So when a new file comes into a user's computer to be stored, the, user, the user's computer will throw out the least recently requested file. So it will prioritize storing the more recent stuff and the more popular stuff. And you've got to have some mechanism, otherwise all the computers just fill up and then the network become useless. Okay, so that's um, a rather rough and uh, approximate description of, of Freenet. And as I said, there's some nice papers online if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of it in more detail. It's just a little bit of a skim, give you some idea about how it works. Now I'm going to have a little bit of a skim for an early version of BitTorrent, give you an idea about how a different kind of peer-to-peer -peer network works. So it's a protocol designed by Bram Curran, 2001. And it's, the idea is that it can efficiently distribute large files. And so um, the idea is, you know, you can have, by using the user's computers, you can efficiently distribute, and the user's bandwidth, um, you can distribute like large files without the need for a big centralized server. And it can even work efficiently on low bandwidth networks. So it's hugely influential. Um, and it's, you know, pretty impressive, right? I mean, it allows you to, you know, just if you've got a, like a, if you're a filmmaker, let's say, You've got a four gig uh, film in Blu-ray in Blu-ray format, something like that, and it's your film. You're perfectly free to distribute it. So you can either you know upload it on Dropbox, or you could upload it on BitTorrent, right? You could because um, uh, it allows you to distribute. You know, you don't have to, to distribute like large files, like a four gig file, something like that. You don't necessarily have to pay money for someone else to host it for you. You can you can distribute it through BitTorrent, in which it, there's no distribution costs associated with it. So it's good for filmmakers who want to distribute their work for free. It's also good for um, Linux distributions. So I've distributed Linux, di downloaded like the four gig Linux install disk from time to time from, from using BitTorrent. So it's great for large files, has high redundancy, and it's fairly resistant to flash crowds because the more people want the file, the more people have the file and are uploading the file. So it's sort of, it doesn't have the problem that the server becomes overloaded because the server is the user's computers themselves. So it's very resistant to flash crowds. There is a ramp up time. So if you distribute a, a file online, initially maybe one computer has the whole file. And then over time, like 10 computers, 100 computers, 1,000 computers start to have the whole file. So it, it does take time for that file to be copied across onto increasingly large numbers of computers so that, it can be, so that the download speed can be uh, greatly reduced. Yeah. Yeah, so the speed increase, sorry, then delay reduce, whatever. Whereas if you put it on Dropbox or something, the, the download speed will be fast straight out of the box. So there are disadvantages. In the early versions of BitTorrent, um, the trackers were a single point of failure. So I'll talk about trackers, the early version. The later version uses a distributed hash table similar to, um, similar to Freenet, <coughs> which introduced other complications, which I'm not going to go into. So how does it work? Well, you put the file on a BitTorrent node, and that's the seed, the source of the file for the other peers. And then this file is broken up in, in chunks, and each chunk is, is hashed. And then um, and this hash lets you know whether the file's been corrupted during the download process, and is also like the key that you use to access the file from the other peers. 
And then you put together what's called a torrent file, a torrent descriptor file, that has a, all the hashes of the file pieces and the details about a tracker. So we have um, tracker computers in BitTorrent, and these are the computers that control, that are like the index server, I think in Napster or whatever, and these trackers hold the information about which, which peers have which seeds so that the, so that the person participating in the bit, the computer participating in BitTorrent can download the seeds from the appropriate users. And the torrent file, you know, it's like Pirate Bay or these kind of other web email, so on, distributes the, these files. So to get the file, that you've got the clients, the software running on the local machine, and this contacts the tracker. It says, I want this particular chunk of the file. And then the tracker will tell you that this chunk's on this IP address and this chunk's on this IP address. And then the client can then contact those IP addresses directly and access that file, those, those chunks of the file. And as it downloads the file, it becomes a source of the, that file for the, other, for the other computers. So this is a general idea. Here's Alice. So she's got her torrent file off you know, the, the internet somewhere. And so she contacts the, and the torrent file has a list, list of the chunks of the list of the hashes of the chunks and it, the address of the tracker. So she contacts the tracker, and the tracker knows about all these peers because they're all contacting it as well, and which peer has which chunk. And so she gets a list of the chunks, and then she contacts the peers, downloads the different bits of the file, and as she downloads them, she becomes a source or a seed of that uh, source of that file, that chunk uh, for the other peers. Uh, bah, 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 yeah. So we've got this tracker. <coughs> so initially, when you're downloading, distributing it, you, there'll be one, one computer that has the entire file, because that's the file that's being contributed to the network. And then it's distributed amongst the other downloaders. And then eventually, you know, there'll be lots of copies of the, each chunk across the network. And that's why it's fast. Trackers have issues, right? The single place you can shut down the network. And you can shut them down with DDoS attacks. And you need a special server to run them. So now, as I said, they've moved towards a distributed hash table, implement, hash table inf implementation. So the client's just some software. So there's lots of different BitTorrent clients out there. That's the software that implements the protocol, does all the file downloading for you. And you've got a nice algorithm selecting the next piece. So um, you want to get, let's say, 100 pieces um, that will add up to be the complete file. And you've got to make a choice about which one do you want to download first. And so the algorithm picks the least popular piece from the other peers and downloads that first. And this increases the download speed. And if you've got, you can't download the entire file until you've got all of the different pieces. And so it's best if you download the least popular piece first, then, then you can make sure that no one else, everyone else can access it. And also if the machine holding the least possible piece you know, shuts down or whatever, then you have to wait ages to get the entire file. So you download the rarest piece first, and then the next rarest piece, and so on and so forth. Because the most common piece, most likely lots of different machines are going to have that anyway, so you can leave that one to last to download. And so the initial seed or initial file is then spread out all the different computers that then become sources of that file for the other computers and so on and so forth. And you want people to donate uh, storage and resources to the network as well as using the network, and therefore you enable you don't want people who just download from BitTorrent. You want people who actually contribute to it so that other people can download as well. And so everyone shares and everyone benefits. So the algorithm limits the downloads you can do if, if you're not uploading as well at the same time. OK, so that's a tiny little you know, bit of an overview on, on BitTorrent and Freenet. I'll just say a few issues about peer-to-peer -peer networks that apply to both of them. So one issue, you know, obvious one, you know, the elephant in the room, right, is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks are often used to share illegal content. So, you know, ripped films, music, et cetera, you know, child pornography, bomb-making manuals, and so on and so forth. But what people forget when they sort of castigate peer-to-peer um, -peer networks is that the World Wide Web is also used to share this kind of content. So it's very easy to build a website that has, you know, a sort of, you know, you press like in the bottom left-hand corner, that leads you to some hidden pages, and you can hide these pages from search engine and all the rest of it. And then if you press on you know, some combination on these pages with a bit of JavaScript, that lets you move through another page, and then you can access all kinds of stuff you know, in that way. So there's lots of ways of hiding stuff on the World Wide Web and distributing it on the World Wide Web without using peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's just they've become a bit notorious, possibly because of the scale of the thing. So as I showed you the upload and download stats, but also if you want to distribute ripped films, you know, it's going to be much faster to, doing that through BitTorrent than doing it through, um, you know, through your own website where you've got to pay for all the storage and all the bandwidth and so on and so forth. 
So they are a bit notorious for that, and probably probably rightly, but not but not in, you know, but you've got to bear in mind that there's other mechanisms that people use to distribute this stuff anyway. But it's a bit more nuanced than that, right? The content that's illegal in one country might be legal in another. So a journalist report on Tiananmen Square, let's say, in China, might be this might be illegal in China, but it might be legal in Britain. So it's not clear, you know, it's not always clear, you know, what's right and what's wrong. It depends on the laws of the country and which country you happen to be in. So, and I've said peer-to-peer -peer networks are also an efficient way of sharing legal content, right? So filmmakers do use it to distribute their films freely. Um, Linux distributions are made over BitTorrent. There's lots of ways in which this is a useful technology. It's used for good as well as for evil, if you like. Yeah, so given give some examples. And, you know, it's the usual, you know, free net and Tor can be used by terrorists and other forms of legal activity. Yes, certainly. I've given you an example of um, uh, Silk Road. But it can also be used by political activists, non-governmental organizations, journalists, that many governments regard as legitimate. So we cheer the journalists for the breaking news story about a massacre in Burma, let's say, or North Korea. But then we criticize, at the same time, the technologies that made that possible. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. It has good stuff, and, and they, they can bring about good things, and they can bring about bad things. <coughs> so to try and the people who don't like peer-to-peer -peer networks um, often try and corrupt them or shut them down. And one, one way to do this is they intentionally share corrupt or incorrect data, data on them. So if you're um, you know, Warner Brothers or Sony or something like that, and you don't like the fact that a peer-to-peer -peer network is uh, sharing you know, uh, sort of a rather dodgy cinema recording of your latest blockbuster, um, what you can do is you can, share, you can do what's called content poisoning. You can share a film that has white noise and claim that that's the, light, the latest uh, Marvel blockbuster. So the users will think that it's you know, the latest Marvel blockbuster, they'll download it, and all they get is a bunch of white noise, well, bunch of white noise, and that would degrade their experience with using the network, and they'll be less likely to try and download other stuff on there. And so that's the content in this case. The video, content of the video is like white noise, it's like a load of junk. Um, but you can also try to poison the index, so you can distribute bogus torrent files, you know, describing data that doesn't exist or corrupt in some way. Um, and in this way, you're, dis you're corrupting people's search experience, people's experience of using the network. You can also do distributed denial of service against uh, the ports that are used for peer-to-peer -peer networks. Only really works um, if, you know, uh, if there are centralized index servers. But you can also carry out DDoS attacks within the network itself by um, faking requests and this kind of thing. I'll say a little bit about that. So let's suppose this is GNU Teller point four again. But it's rather a good example. Let's suppose we want to, um, you know, overload the bandwidth of the network. I mean, it does that by itself. But let's suppose we're of malicious intent here. So what I can do is I can flood the network with requests. So this, these are malicious nodes here, and these are malicious nodes are pretending to be uh, this node here. So they're so they're sending a request for a file, let's say, that claims to be from this node. So they're sending 500 requests here. And then all of these other nodes are replying to the request to the node to the target node here. So they're sending out, you know, 1,500, uh, 2,500 message requests, and then that's getting amplified through the network. And then this node here is completely unable to do anything because it's just getting 3,500 messages, which you never sent in the first place. So this is in this way you can have like a distributed denial of service attack within a peer-to-peer -peer network, particularly if it's not very well designed. Um, each node is contributing resources to the network, and that can lead to uh, performance issues of the user's computers, right? If you're, you know, if it's uploading tons of stuff into BitTorrent and you're downloading, you know, and people are using storing files or whatever in your system, that can use up your bandwidth, your CPU, and so on. And this can be an issue with Freenet, um, and also an issue with BitTorrent, which fills up your hard drive and offers fast download. So another issue to think about. Another issue to fix with your algorithms as well, to some extent. So there's some further reading there, and just to wrap it up. So this network, we talked about peer-to-peer -peer networks. A little bit of an overview about Freenet and BitTorrent. I haven't really gone into the real details. I think the emulation we'll do in the seminar might help a little bit. And um, next lecture, we're going to look into some of the types of online games that there are, and that's going to be a way of setting you up for your second mini-project. <laughs>